Corinthians chapter 4. And we're going to be looking at verses 14 through 21. And we're going to be studying what it is to be in the kingdom of power. What does that actually mean? And so in order to do so, I'm going to ask you to go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. I'm reading out of the English Standard Version translation. And I'll be reading from verses 14 through 21. 1 Corinthians 4, 14 through 21. The word of the Lord says, I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you then, be imitators of me. That is why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ, as I teach them everywhere in every church. Some are arrogant, as though I were not coming to you. But I will come to you soon, if the Lord wills. And I will find out not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. What do you wish? Shall I come to you with the rod, or with love, in a spirit of gentleness? That is the word of the Lord. In a sense, this chapter concludes a very long introduction by Paul, and as we'll begin to look at in chapters 5 and on, Paul will begin to deal with specific issues in the church of, of Corinth uh, that have not been dealt with. But in this section, we, we, we bring our attention to this word and specifically this phrase, kingdom of power. And if we're honest with ourselves, the idea of power is not new to us. It's not strange to us. In fact, in our culture, people fight for power all the time. Economic power and technological power, um, political power, military power. This is common in, in our world today. The idea of what it means to be powerful, which often involves wealth and corruption and a bunch of other stuff. But this is also true of the church. The church desires power in a different sense. In fact, in our modern day, and this always astonishes me because it seems like every generation has new ministers full of power. And the old ones, because of scandals and, and failure and immoral failures, tend to fall away. And you think, all right, finally this evil doctrine is, is done with. And nope, here comes a whole new generation of individuals who claim to have power. And they can deliver Christians from demons, which to me is ironic that you would spend 45 minutes in a church service delivering Christians who have demons. And I say ironic but because how can Christians have demons? And that's a weird thing for me to understand. And the reason why is because there's no example of that in Scripture. But here's my point. That the church is familiar with this terminology of kingdom of power, but it's shifted it into something else. Where ministers have this mantra or this essence of, ooh, they're powerful. They can prophesy and see visions. And, and there's this false view of power. And whether it's the culture or the church world, in some ways... Everyone wants power. And so this text begs us to wrestle with the question, what exactly does Paul mean? And even Jesus, he talks much about the kingdom. What do they mean when they say the kingdom of power? What is that? And this text will introduce us to this idea. I only have two points. We'll look at this by observing spiritual fathers. So every kingdom of power has spiritual fathers, and it also has godly living, which is what we'll observe today. So let's look at this idea. What does Paul mean by 
spiritual fathers. How does that connect to the kingdom of power? Well, look at verse 14. I do not write these things to make you ashamed. The Greek word here, entrepo, literally means to shame someone. It's, the picture is making fun of someone to the point where their self-esteem gets low. So think here, if you grew up in high school and grammar school, all the mama jokes you memorized to make someone feel bad, or, or the fat jokes, or the skinny jokes, or the glasses jokes, or whatever it is, that's the picture here. And Paul says, I'm not writing everything that I've said. The things that I've said are not to make you feel bad. They're not to lower your self-esteem. They're not to bring you to shame. Now, these things aren't just what we learned last week about suffering. No, no. Paul is getting at everything that he's talked to them about thus far, every correction that he's made. What are some things that Paul has addressed? Well, we'll see some of this again in these verses. But if you remember, Paul has addressed with them their love for eloquent speech and rhetoric. The Corinthians loved rhetoric. They're, 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 in fact, the reason why they had favorite preachers had to do with how they speak, not the content so much, but just their simple form of communication. So Corinth is in love with rhetoric. They're in love with worldly wisdom. Paul has addressed that, not to shame them, but because he needs to correct them. He's addressed their division. They're quarreling amongst one another, not to shame them, but to correct them. He's addressed their carnality. Now, think about this. He's called the church of Corinth carnal-minded, that they have carnal practices. And so he's addressed that, but again, not to shame them, not to make them feel bad. He's addressed their love for favorite preachers. I am of Apollos. I am of Cephas or Peter. I am of Paul or I am of Christ. Those are the really holy, holy, holy ones. And he's addressed that issue as well. Not to shame them, to correct them. And he's addressed specifically in this context of chapter 4, the leader's unwillingness to suffer. They don't want to suffer. They, they think that's a false view of the Christian life. And so Paul has dealt with that issue with them. Again, not to shame, but to correct. And so he continues and says, I must admonish you as my beloved children. And we'll come back to that in a second. But here's what's interesting. Paul addresses the church of Corinth as children. Now, we need to understand this because there are times where Paul says you ought to be teachers, but you act like children. In those cases, it's dealing with maturity. Not so much here. This is a term of endearment. But why does Paul call them children? Well, look at verse 15. You have countless guides in Christ, but you do not have many fathers. This idea of countless guides, says the ESV, let me read to you some translations of this phrase. The Christian Standard Bible says, you have countless instructors. The New International Version says you have 10,000 others to teach you. The King James says 10,000 instructors. And again, in our English language, when we hear words like instructors and, and teachers, we think of classroom setting, you know, history class, whatever, math class. And, and, and that's our picture, or, or Sunday school class. The actual Greek says 10,000 paidogos. But these are not instructors, they're not teachers. They're kind of like a mix of babysitter slash tutor. These uh, people were often hired by the wealthy. They're actually, the majority of them were, were slaves. So they're the slaves in the house of their master and their duty was to in one sense, train, give etiquette to the children of these wealthy individuals. And so they would train them. But, but what's interesting is that oftentimes these paidogos, these, again, babysitters slash tutors who are teaching children how to be polite, how to, be, how to live morally, how to, how, to do, how to share and have good behavior, they were always seen walking around with a stick. Now you get the picture. These paidogos were 
not just tutors, but if the child wasn't listening with words, they had the authority to give palia, as we would say in, in Spanish. You know, a, a, little, a little nudge of encouragement to, to use kind words. They, they were teachers who guided children with a stick. And Paul says to the church of Corinth, you got a lot of those. The picture is you have a lot of church leaders who love to correct roughly, but what you don't have is fathers. And that's Paul's concern. You got plenty of teachers who provide instruction, but not without care. You see the distinction. These paidogos were paid to teach children how to behave good, but there was no love involved. At least in some cases, there wasn't. Their job was just, I need to make sure little Timmy is well behaved so that the master doesn't get mad at me. And if I have to strike him with the stick, I will. That's it. That's the relationship. Paul says you got plenty of those. What you don't have is actual fathers, people who care about you. And so Paul calls this church of Corinth children because he is their father. Now, in this letter, Paul has addressed already about himself different titles. In Corinthians 1.1, he is their apostle. In Corinthians 3.5, he is their servant. We are to serve the text, says Paul. We looked at that weeks ago. In 1 Corinthians 3.6, he is a planter. I planted, Apollos watered. The idea there is he was the first to bring the gospel. In 1 Corinthians 3.9, he is God's fellow worker. In 1 Corinthians 3.10, he is God's master builder. And in 1 Corinthians 4.1, he is a servant and a steward of God's word. In other words, when Paul says, uh, you don't have many fathers, it's a concern of his. But, but this, this is not a new title in the church. He's painting a picture of care. Paidogos instruct rudely because they have no care. I am your pastor, Paul says. I am your apostle, your servant. And, and all these titles that he's given and included in that is a father. I care for you. That's the idea of Paul. He's not saying what a lot of churches today say. Oh, you got to call me daddy. Please don't, don't call me daddy. That's not a church title. Some of you already know your, your mind works fast. So after service, you're going to come up to me. What up, big poppy? Don't. I ain't David Ortiz. But, but some preachers, believe it or not, especially in the Hispanic culture, they walk around and they tell their church, you are my child. And, and they call them sons and daughters. And, and they, they have this, you got to call me father. And that's not the idea here. Paul is saying you don't have many fathers, but this is not a new church title. The titles are pastor, deacons, that's it. Those are the ones you see in the New Testament, especially as we move further along in history. This is not a new church title. So why does Paul say, I am your spiritual father? Again, it's a picture of care. You're my beloved children. And in this section, Paul gives us five marks of a spiritual father. What's interesting to me is a lot of these guys that say, you got to call me father, don't often look like what Paul says here. And he says, you don't have many fathers. That's a problem. So what do spiritual fathers, disciples, mentors look like? This is not just a call for pastors. Every Christian ought to be a father. Or if you're a female, a spiritual mother or a discipler, a, a mentor, a guide. But where does this start? Why does Paul say, I am your spiritual father? Well, we begin with, Verse 15, Paul says, I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. You have countless paidogos who hit, they don't care, but, but I am your father, I became. Literally the word there is, I birth you. Now again, and let's not add common nonsense of our culture today. He's using this word beget to make a point. What did Paul beget? It's not literal, I birth you. The picture here is 
I was the first one to bring you the gospel. So number one, what is the mark of a spiritual father? It's their gospel fathers. They're evangelists. They bring people to faith, you see. And again, the problem with a lot of these pastors that want this title of father is they brought no one to the faith. They just want to tell a thousand people that they're their spiritual dad. But Paul says the first mark of a father that cares is they bring the gospel. Fathers are the ones who bring the gospel. They are evangelists. They're the ones that go into the world, see someone that does not know Christ, and they birthed them. They brought the gospel. This is why it astonishes me because there's discipleship in the church is so popular and people write books on how to disciple and, and how to mentor and, and spend time and drink coffee and, 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 and go out and get to know each other. And there is some truth to that. But Paul says it begins with teach them the gospel. Preach to them the gospel. Go into the streets and find those who don't know the gospel. And that's what makes you their father, you see. This is what it means to be a spiritual father. It starts here. And in this phrase, I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel, we get the threefold aspect of salvation. Notice what Paul doesn't say. He doesn't say, I saved you. Paul says, I brought you the gospel through Jesus Christ, in Christ Jesus through the gospel. The source is Christ. He's the one who saves. It's his blood on the cross that saves. The content, the gospel, that we ought to preach the gospel. That's the content of the message. And then the agent is the preacher. In this case, it's Paul. But the order is important. Paul's not saying, I saved you, follow me. No, no, no. He's being clear here. The source of your salvation is Christ and Christ alone. And the content, what gets you to understand salvation is God's word. It's, it's the gospel. Paul isn't coming with experience or his words or his content. No, it's Christ. The content is the gospel. And all Paul is is an agent. He's a preacher. He's a messenger. That's it. You see the doctrine here beautifully explained in this one phrase. Paul isn't taking credit for Corinth's salvation. He recognizes that that is Christ and Christ alone. But friends, that's the problem in our church today. The modern church lacks fathers. It lacks disciples. And the reason it lacks fathers and disciples, spiritual leaders, mentors, is because the church today no longer evangelizes. The church today no longer spreads the gospel. Young people today are more ashamed to talk about Christ and less ashamed to put pronouns on their social medias to fit the culture. It's the world we live in. There is no gospel preaching. There is a, a, there is a famine of spiritual fathers in the church today. There are too many dinosaurs in the church. And that's a good thing in one sense because it's a testament of faithful ministry to have elderly in the church. But the problem is there are too many of those and not enough crying babies. There's not enough new converts in churches today that are saying, who is Jesus? What is the gospel? I need to know more. Tell me more about this Christ. And so Paul's concern here is you don't have many fathers. And guess what? That is true today. The church of Christ does not have many fathers because he lacks Evangelists, it lacks people that tell other peoples about Christ and are willing to walk them through the faith. And so that's the first mark of a spiritual father. They bring the gospel. They are gospel fathers. The second mark is they are loving fathers. Go back to verse 14. Again, I don't write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. Loving fathers Admonish. Loving fathers must correct. So not only do spiritual fathers bring the gospel, but spiritual fathers understand that they must correct. They must 
Admonish. And, and this makes sense in our world. If, if you have children, you recognize this. Uncorrected children grow up to be spoiled brats. That's just the reality of it. They do. They, they, they think everything's owed to them. They're spoiled. Uh, it, it's just, it's not good behavior. You need to correct your children in a wise way, in a, in a loving way, but you need to correct them. And, and the same is true for the church. Uncorrected church members, as we'll see, become prideful. They become boastful. They become puffed up. And so fathers must correct. Part of being a, a, a spiritual father is not just, again, that you bring the gospel, but that you're a loving father, and, and this love appears through correction. I love Acts chapter 20. It's Paul's final message to his Ephesian elders. It's a pastor talking to Pastors, he's trained up in love. And many people have used rightly that text to, to explain pastoral ministry and, and to explain uh, how one ought to teach the whole counsel of God. And it's an amazing text to use, but there is an amazing picture of love there. It's my favorite part of Acts chapter 20. It's towards the end. And it's Paul and his Ephesian elders, and they are weeping. For their pastor who's about to go to Jerusalem and they believe it'll be the last time they see him. Now why do I love that? Because it's a picture of beloved children. You see often in pastoral ministry we hear about pastors talk, I could be guilty of this at times, but talk about the hardships of pastoral ministry. The loneliness of pastoral ministry. But rarely do pastors talk about the people who are there and who are loving and who are caring, and who weep, and support, and carry, and help. And that's something missing, and you see it in Acts chapter 20. It's a beautiful picture of what love looks like in ministry. And I want to let you know it exists. There is this love that Paul has for Corinth. He has a care. It's the same love he had for the Ephesian elders. It's, it's the necessity that love is needed in ministry, but love comes with correction. And we see examples of this in Scripture. When there is no correction and the dangers of it. In Leviticus 10, you'll remember it's Aaron's children. It's almost as if Aaron forgot to instruct them on how to do temple worship. And so Nadab and Abihu, the scripture says they did their own thing. And as a result, they, they were killed. There's a lack of instruction in Aaron's part. You see it in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 2, verses 12 and on. Eli's sons. Eli is a parent who has not dealt with his children to the point where they're at the entrance door and they're sleeping around with the ladies that are coming in to the tent, to the booth. They're on the doorway. Just picture that, not greeting the ladies, but flirting with the ladies and seducing the ladies. And as a result, they also get punished by the Lord. They lose their life. These are examples of, of cases when fathers do not correct, even in Scripture. It doesn't end well. In 2 Samuel 14, we read that Amnon had raped Tamar, and, and it's amazing to me David's response. The text only says David got angry. That's it. Never did anything. We don't get any evidence to the point where Absalom, his other brother, kills Amnon. And, and eventually that results in him starting a revolt against his father. He was, so, he was so torn by his father's lack of discipline that he raises a rebellion against him. These are the consequences when fathers do not correct children and it's a reminder for us that love is not separate from correction. Spiritual mentors must bring the gospel. They ought to love on their people. But love includes correction. It is an important aspect of the Christian faith. The third mark of a loving father is they are model fathers. Look at verse 16. I urge you then... Be imitators of me. Fathers, disciples, they're models of 
the Christian life. In other words, Paul isn't saying, look, y'all, I know how to teach you things. And I know how to bring you the gospel. And I know how to correct you. But notice what Paul says. I don't just talk the talk. I also walk the walk. He isn't just saying, listen to my words. This is actual, actually Jesus' judgment on the Pharisees. He says, listen to their words. Their doctrine is great. Their, their teachings are amazing. But don't do what they do. Why? Because that's their problem. It's not that they don't got biblical theology down and systematic theology down. It's not that they don't have these, these systems and, and models that are very important to the faith. They have that all down. Their problem is they know a lot. They live so little. And that may be true of us. I know where Genesis is and I can find Habakkuk. Let's do a Bible contest of where the books of the Bible are. And many of you will pass that test. Amen, amen, amen. But can you live what it says? And Paul says, as a father, I didn't just bring the gospel. I'm not just loving with correctness, but I have modeled for you the faith. It reminds me, um, parents do this all the time. It's hilarious to me. And we, we do it too with, with my wife. We, we play these games, right, where you have your children and they're, when they're good and they're loving and they're like, you know, playful. And that's like, oh, that's, that's all me. That's what I always tell my wife. That's, man, he got my genes. That's, that's all me right there. The love, the care, the friendliness. And then they start acting up. And I always tell my wife, go get your child. That, that's your side of the family right there. Parents do that in a playful way. But that's what Paul is getting at here. What you've learned, do you model? And if you're a parent or you've been around children, you know that children learn more by what they see than what they hear. Now, the hearing is important. The instruction is important. I don't want to minimize that. But often children learn more from what they see than what they hear. What you teach can be contradicted by what you here, this word, I urge you then, be imitators of me, is not a tone of rebuke. It's not a, a tone of anger. It's actually an encouragement. Paul is saying, imitate me. But specifically, in this context, Paul isn't being broad here. You see, some don't mind imitating Paul in how he's built churches or how he teaches but Paul is here being very specific. In what way should they imitate him? It's what Pastor Jonathan has been talking about the last four weeks. They are to imitate him in, in this, verse 11, to the present, this is chapter 4, verse 11, to the present hour we hunger and thirst. We are poorly dressed and buffeted and homeless. And we labor working with our own hands. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. We have become and are still like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. Can you imitate them in that? In other words, the Christian life isn't all glamour and prosperity and moments of joy. It includes that at times. But it also includes suffering. And as we have learned these past four weeks, some in Corinth were like, nope, that's not what Christians go through. And so Paul has to explain that is exactly what we go through. We will go through times of suffering, including persecution. And so Paul is saying, imitate me as I imitate Christ in this sense. I imitate Christ in his sufferings. Christians are going to suffer. We will suffer in this world. And so Paul has even modeled for them how they ought to cling to Christ and trust in Christ even in the midst of suffering. So he is a modeled father. Fourth aspect of a father is he's a reproducing father. Look at verse 17. That is why I sent you Timothy. Again, this term, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord. He's a reproducing father. Fathers reproduce in others. Disciplers reproduce in others. Mentors reproduce in others. Now notice 
Paul's phrasing here. He just said, I urge you to be imitators of me because I imitate Christ. And the logical thing would be, and I'm on my way. But that's not what Paul says. He's saying, church leaders in, in Corinth, you have not imitated me, but I'm not going to go. He, he wants to go, and we'll see that. But before he can even get there, he says, I'm going to send to you my son. In other words, one who has imitated me in all these things. For this reason, I sent you Timothy. It's not Paul who's on the way. It's Timothy. He's not there yet, as many commentators agree. He's on his way. This is one of the people Paul evangelized. It's one of the people Paul discipled. It's one of the people Paul instructed in the faith. Paul has many sons. Titus is a son. Timothy is a son. Onesimus in Philemon verse 10 is a son. He's actually a slave of someone else. And, Tim, and Paul brought him the gospel. He's a son in the faith. But, but that's exactly Paul's point. The church leaders in Corinth have not imitated him well, so Paul is sending a son. You see, fathers reproduce themselves in others. Disciplers make disciplers who make other disciples. You see how this trickles down. It's why Matthew and uh, Jesus, sorry, in Matthew chapter 28 says, go into all the world and make disciples. It's the great commission. We ought to make disciples, disciples. Make other disciples, fathers, make other fathers in the faith. These leaders did not know how to imitate Paul and consequently Christ, but Timothy does. There is an importance to this. What is it? That often church members say a lot about a church. In fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2, Paul will say of Corinth, this. Look, go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. You can, we can look at this uh, together. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I'll read it from, from verse 1. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do, do we need, as some do, letters of recommendation to you or from you? Look at verse 2. You yourselves are our letter of recommendation written on our hearts to be known and read by all. A lot of us, you know, we, we ask for recommendation letters to a new job, to colleges, and all that. Paul says, you don't need a recommendation letter from us. You are our recommendation letter. The point is, again, church members say a lot about their church. Now, this can be a good thing. This can be a not-so-good thing. Allow me to explain. I know you want me to explain. Let me explain. There are some people that walk out of here and they model Christ well and they're reading their Bible and, and, and they, they, they take classes and they get asked questions about Jesus and apologetic questions and different things and they're able to answer. And, and, and sometimes Christians even get astonished and go, man, I haven't learned that in my church, the Trinity. We, don't, we never talk about the Trinity sin. We never talk, but what church do you go to? The gospel? What's the gospel? There's actually a testimony of a member here who started coming because he showed up to church. He had been going to church forever, but he showed up to church and someone asked him, hey, what's the gospel? And he didn't know what it was. And he started coming to church because someone explained to him what the gospel is. And he realized, I'm not getting taught that at my church. And he had been going for quite some time. And some people do this. And then eventually the person asks, well, what church do you go to? Oh, I go to Vida. Oh, yeah. I've heard of that church. They're, they're really into the Bible. And right, the pastor, Jonathan, right, he... He, he does these videos and, and, and these men's studies. And, and it's just, yeah, I've heard about that church. It's amazing. But others can give a different name to a church. And it's whatever song we sang today. I, I can't remember, you know, great is our God, how greatly to be praised. But, but yesterday night it was, girl, I want you back that thing up. And, and they're in these venues and they're in these stories. And so Saturday is 
one venue and Sunday is another venue and we're here and we're there. And then people ask, what church do you go to? Oh, yeah, that's that liberal church, right? They don't really talk about. So you see, members can get people to think a lot about the church they go to. And so my admonition to you is as members, please model us well. We are not advocating for such behaviors and such venues. We don't advocate for you to get tipsy on Saturday night and then come holy on Sunday morning. That's just not what we advocate for. What we advocate for is what Paul wanted from this church. He wanted to reproduce children like Timothy, who modeled the faith the same way he has to be followers of Christ. Now, Paul calls Timothy a faithful child. In what way is Timothy a faithful child? Well, we don't have time to go through these, but in Acts chapter 16, all the way to Acts chapter 20, Timothy has been faithfully following Paul throughout his missionary journeys. Through persecution, tribulation, and his teaching, and in his preaching, Timothy has been there. He's seen it all. In fact, in, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 19, Paul says three people brought the gospel to Corinth. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. He's also a, a faithful child in that way. Is that Again, he's one of these spiritual fathers that has imitated Paul well. He has followed Paul's example well. And again, that's what I want you to see. Disciplers make disciplers, which should raise the question to us. How am I modeling the faith to others? If I have people that are following me, if you're a father, you have children who follow you in the faith. If you're a mother, you have children who automatically follow you in the faith. How are you modeling the faith to your children? Is church important? Is worship important? And I don't just mean coming to church as part of it, but is there Bible reading at home? Is there time of prayers at home? How are you modeling the faith to your children, you see? We, we all are called to reproduce, to make disciples. And, and, and Paul's desire for the leaders in Corinth is, hey, we want more Timothys, not what, what's been happening here. Disciples reproduce. Timothy is one of these disciples. But, but in what way is Timothy faithful? Well, this is the last mark of a spiritual father. A father teaches, specifically, they teach doctrine. And this is important because in some churches, it's, it's an ugly word, doctrine, doctrine. Is that really what Paul is getting at? Notice verse 17 again. This is what, that is why I sent you, Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ. And notice here, as I teach them everywhere in every church. To remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach them. Teach them what? How to exercise or rebuke demons. How to do miracles and signs. No. What Paul taught was doctrine. What he asked Timothy to teach was doctrine. How do we know? Because I teach this what? Everywhere and every what? Church. You see, often you, you hear... Ministers, and again, there's a lot of books on this, depending on the church you go to, identify its culture. Identify its, its cultural context, and there's some importance to that. But you hear ministers say things like, well, you know, if you're in this church, you got to focus on men. And if you're in this church, you got to focus on youth. And if you're in this church, it's marriages. And in, in this church, it's, it's women. And, and my answer to all those questions is young people need doctrine and Women need doctrine and men need doctrine and marriages need doctrine because we all need to know who God truly is. The problem in the church is that we know the moral aspects of our faith which are important, especially in the times we live in today, but we have no clue about the God who gave them. Let me explain. Some of you know not to steal and not to murder, but you can't explain the Trinity. Some of you know 
moral aspects of our faith. God created man and women, and we ought to uphold to this. And yes, we ought to. But you can't explain to me or name three attributes of God. And even if you can name them, you can't explain them. And this is Paul's point. What is the church lacking? It's lacking doctrine. So Paul, go teach them doctrine. I teach doctrine everywhere, in every place, in every church. What's lacking in these churches is doctrine. And this is why when we disciple people, you must include doctrine. Fathers are teachers of doctrine. They walk people through the fundamentals of the faith. Why? Because I've seen this over the years. When we only get marriages right, which is important, and we only get life right, I've seen married people restore their marriages and then they end up Mormon. Why? Because they understood the moral aspects of marriage life, but no one ever taught them who Jesus was. And you have people that come to church and it's, we need to hear this about sin and this to men and that to men. And then a Jehovah Witness knocks on their door and they just go, oh, yeah, let me follow them. Because there's no doctrine. And so Paul says, I'm nervous for Corinth because you do not have many fathers. You have many teachers who hit with the stick, but not gospel fathers and Loving fathers and model fathers and reproducing fathers and fathers who teach doctrine. And if we want to live in a kingdom of power, we need disciplers and spiritual mentors and fathers. That's the first aspect. The second is we need a godly lifestyle. And as time is ticking, I will rush through some of these verses. But here's why Paul says this. Some are arrogant as though I were not coming to you. The very word here, arrogant, means puffed up. It's honestly, it's not because you're eating a lot of tacos and enchiladas and you're puffed up. It means to be puffed up in pride. You're, you're like a balloon. You're being inflated with pride. Some of you have become arrogant. It's interesting. This word for arrogant, physio, appears seven times in the New Testament, six of them are in this letter. There's only one other case in Colossians. Six times Paul will call this church prideful, prideful, prideful. In 1 Corinthians 4, 6, they're prideful because of who they follow. In 18 and 19, we'll look at this in a second. It has to do with pride and words and speech. In 5, 2, it's pride that keeps them from exercising church discipline. In 8, 1, is pride that they have knowledge of food offered to idols and the Gentile zone. And so that teaching has made them prideful. And in 13, 4, it's love is not prideful. Time and time again, Paul is going to deal with the leaders of this church and he's going to address their issue of pride again uncorrected, undisciplined children result in pride. Their pride here is, we don't think Paul is coming. Some of you have become arrogant as though I were not coming to you. That's their thinking. He ain't coming. And if he does, I'm of Peter anyway. I don't have to listen to Paul. And if he does, I'm of Apollos anyway. I don't have to listen to Paul. And if he does, I'm of Jesus anyway. I don't have to listen to Paul. It's pride and pride and pride and pride. And so Paul says in verse 19, I will find out not the talk of these arrogant. This is important for us to get. Look back. What does Paul mean here about talk? 1 Corinthians, if you have your Bibles open, chapter 1, verses 17 and 18. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent or talk, words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. What's Paul's point? I will not come to find out the talk of these arrogant. 
Well, it's back to what he's been correcting all along. The church of Corinth believed the power was in eloquent speech. Hey, Paul, are you a good communicator? Can you persuade? Are you like the philosophers of the day who their power is in their ability to persuade? They are good with their words. And what does Paul say? I didn't come with words of persuasion. The power is not in my words. I didn't construct the argument to such a point where everyone was convinced because of my words, because of my eloquent speech, that Jesus is true to follow. No, Paul says, I came not with the wisdom of the world and the eloquent speech, the persuasion of the philosophers of the day. No, I came with a message that's foolish. It's the cross, that Jesus died for sinners, to save sinners. And all of Corinth goes, well, that's foolish. How are you going to convince people of that? And Paul says, I don't care. I didn't come to convince them with words. I came to convince them with the message of the cross. And so he reiterates it in chapter 2. It's not my words. It's not my speech. It's not my wisdom. I came with the gospel, the proclamation of the gospel. And so verse 4 is a tricky word, verse. When we learned this back then, you can listen to Pastor Jonathan's sermon on this. But he says, I did not come with words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. That word demonstration means to persuade in the spirit. What does persuading in the spirit mean? Well, here it means that the power to convert wasn't in the words. It was the work of the Holy Spirit. I didn't seek to persuade someone with convincing words. I preached the message of the cross. And guess who's powerful enough to get blind men to see? It's not my words. It's who? The Holy Spirit. So what does it mean to demonstrate with the spirit of power is to preach the gospel and watch the spirit turn blind eyes into eyes that see the glory of Christ. That's the spirit of power. And Paul says, I will not find out the talk of these arrogance, but their power. This isn't a Harry Potter showdown where... Paul's on this corner and he's got his wand or Star Wars, whatever you want to envision. And he's going to be throwing out his force and his power. And on the other side are these religious leaders and they're, you know, and it's a battle of power and blah, blah. That's not what they're getting at. And that's why the foolishness of what some people make this text to mean. Paul is saying, I'm not going to look at their words. I don't want to listen to their talk. I want to look at their power. What's their power? If they really have the Holy Spirit, show me. You see why the emphasis of spiritual fathers, they make disciples. But now Paul is really getting at, oh, you got power? Show me. You claim that the Holy Spirit lives in you? Show me. Again, it's, it's Matthew 7. Paul says, I'm not concerned with how they talk. I'm concerned with do they live by what they preach. And that's why in Matthew 7, Jesus extends the list to beyond words. Some will say, we did miracles. You and I would look at that and go, man, that dude is powerful. God uses him powerfully. God uses her powerfully. Deliverance ministry, wow, powerful. And what does Jesus say? I never knew you. In Jesus' case, he's like, I don't even know your words and your deeds don't mean anything because power in the kingdom, how is it defined? It's not defined by talk. It's defined by how one Lives, And then we get this phrase. It's a famous phrase in verse 20. For the kingdom of God does not consist in speech, in ability to persuade with words, but it exists in the power of the Holy Spirit to truly bring lost people to life. And how do we know that it's the Holy Spirit who's done it and not words of wisdom by the way they walk? That's what Paul is saying. The kingdom of power has fathers who do all the five things that we saw. But the kingdom of power also has people that walk in the fruit of the spirit. They have evidence of salvation. They're not just claiming to be saved and living like the world. No, no, these people talk the talk, but they also walk the walk. And Paul is saying, I'm going to go to Corinth. I'm going to look at these leaders, and we're going to truly see who's been converted, you see. That's the message of Paul. And it's in a tone of love. 
How do we know? Verse 21, Paul says this very humorly. What do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod? He's going back to the idea of these pedagogos in verse 15. You want me to come to you like these teachers? Some of us like that. We need to have our spiritual ears pulled. And you like when the preacher calls you into the counseling meeting and yells at you for five hours. And then you walk out here, all right, all right, I'm going to get my life together. Some of us like that. But that's not what Paul is saying. That's not the right way to do ministry. And so he says, do you want me to come to you with a stick? With, with the rod like the pedagogos do where they just hit people but there's no relationship? Or do you want me to come to you with love and a spirit of gentleness like a father? And love, which one you, you, you pick is what he's saying. But verse 21, and we'll see this in the rest of this letter, Paul's going to show us the importance of church discipline. There are times when leaders, spiritual fathers, must discipline the church. And we'll be looking at that in chapter 5 when you have a case where the church has not disciplined fornication between a mother or stepmother and their son. It's a grievous sin, and the church swept it under the rug. But this beginning introduction, a lengthy one, ends here. And what we learn in 1 Corinthians 4, 14 through 21 is that if we want to live in a kingdom of power, we need fathers who bring the gospel, and we need sons who live it out. We need fathers who bring the gospel, and we need sons who live it out. I'm going to ask that you bow your head and let us pray together. Father, we thank you for the riches and the beauty of your word. As the very psalmist says, your words are better than honey. They're sweeter than life. They are more precious than precious stones, more valuable than even gold refined by the fire. Father, I pray that you would help us to see that, that we would fall in love with you through your word. And Father, we pray that you would help us, help us, Lord, to be spiritual fathers to others. Help us to be disciples, evangelists, but also, Lord, help us to live in a kingdom of power because we live out the faith. This world needs Christians who are the real deal. Father, help us be salt and light in a world that is flavorless and full of darkness. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. Church, you are dismissed this morning. God bless you.